Good morning, World Outreach Revival Center. Can we give Jesus a big hand of praise? A little shallow this morning. I know folks are coming in, and we do like to start on time, especially because of the uh, live feed. And those that might uh, be a part of the service later. Um, sometimes, well, during the service, there's not a whole lot of people, but as the week goes on, they might be 100, 200. We don't do any of those boost anything. It's just people just uh, come and look, and, um, and we appreciate it. But let's just open in prayer. We're going to invite the Holy Spirit in today to come and move. We want to welcome each of you and those that are on the way. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your house. But Lord, we pray for your presence, O oh God. We pray for the spirit of unity, Lord. Yes. We pray for those that are out of town, God, that they be not going to be here today. Father, several families I know that are in different locations, be with them. Yes. Give them travel mercies, God. Just cover them. But those that are coming today, Lord, be with them as they journey. Those that are here, be with us, Lord, as we exalt your name. Lord, we pray for the Lee family, God, that you will bring quick healing in their body, Father. In Jesus' name. And Father, that you will just touch each one. We honor you, we praise you, and we thank you for your great goodness. In Jesus' name. Are you ready to worship the King? Come on, can you stand your feet one moment? Let's just give the Lord one more big shout. Yeah. 
on your feet now, applaud God, bring a gift of laughter, sing yourselves into his presence. Know this, God is God, and God, God, he made us, we didn't make him, we're his people, his well-tended sheep. Enter the password, thank you, make yourselves at home, talking, praise, thank you. Worship him, for God is sheer beauty, all generous, and love, loyal, always, and ever. I think he deserves all the honor and all the glory. So I think that this is a warning that we shouldn't be, whatever is going on in life, whether if the walls are falling down, we came here to worship him and to praise him. And he's worthy of all the honor and of all the glory. Yeah. And we're in this house today. So what's a better way? Let's let's uh, kick the shoes off. Let's get comfortable in our father's house. And let's give him what he deserves. Yeah. Let's worship the king.
before we go to the next uh, worship song, this is a, Melissa just gave this to me, and um, I I believe it's a word for somebody in the house this morning. And usually, when God gives a word, it's for more than one. And it can also be for you online. It says, "My desire is for my people to know me."
Hear the sound of the breakthrough coming. I hear the sound of the breakthrough coming. I hear the sound of a breakthrough coming. It's called.
I don't hear a see a, a hand, but I hear the sound of the power of the presence of God. I hear the sound of a people rising up. I hear the sound of His presence. I hear the sound of His glory. I hear the sound of God's presence flowing over the lands. Come on. Very strong. By Jesus. Lord, anyone online, touch them right now, Father. Touch them right now. My God. My God. Melissa, come up when you're done. Stand beside them, please. Says early in the morning before the sun rose, 
And she was at that too. And Marcus, come, I'm going to pray with them if you don't mind. Just come join me. Um, and she was at the tomb. Just keep your eyes closed, ladies, and just listen. She was at the tomb. Listen to me. She was not worried. Listen to me close. She was not worried about who's going to move the stone. She just knew, I must go to where he is. And she, because of that tenacity and that strength, she didn't move a stone at all. And the angels did. And, and I'm going to say this, you know, it, it, this may seem like this is not even the way the Bible portrays it, but do you know the stone didn't have to move away so he could get out? Everybody knows that. And also, do you know that he appeared in a, a room with Peter, James, and John? He came to where they were. And also, an angel told them where to go. Can I propose just a simple thought, whether we want to receive it or not? It's a viewpoint. What if the angels were sent just to move the stone for Mary? Did you hear me? What if the angels were sent just to move the stone for Mary? Because she says, I'm going to where he is. Just a thought. So, Father, we lift up these three ladies right now, Lord. Come on, Marcus, lay hands on them. Father, from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet, thank you for her love for you, God. Her tenacity. Her strength. Her strength. Let me tell you something. I know sometimes you don't feel strong. I know that as a pastor and as a friend and as a spiritual father. But let me make it very clear to you. Mary, you are strong. Mary that went to the tomb. <laughs> I never got that until just now. <laughs> You're strong, says the Lord. You are stronger than you know. You are strong. You're a mighty warrior before the Lord. You're a mighty warrior. You are strong before his presence. Keep running. Keep running it hard. And God said, the reward will be yours. It's his promise. My God, I, I lift these ladies up right now. Father, the hunger, the desire, the passion, Lord God, for you and your presence, Lord. From the crown of her head to the soles of her feet, Lord. My God, my God, my God, my God. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Shura Mahai. Nothing would stop you from getting to that tomb. Nothing, Shonda. You would have made it there. You'd have went through the floods. You'd have went through the, the, the battles that people tried to prevent you. You wouldn't stop because you've got that tenacity to say, I, I love my Jesus and nothing's going to hold me back. So God, we thank you for the righteous purity and the holiness that you rest upon her, God. Strengthen her, Lord. Strengthen her daily. Strengthen her, God. Because, Lord, there's a light that she must carry to a lost and dying world. A torch, oh God, that others must see, Father God. And give her boldness, Lord, to speak your words. And let the light burn strong. Literally, I see your hands holding a torch straight up in the air. It's not like a candle. It's a torch. <laughs> Very powerful. God, we lift this up right now, Lord. Thank you, Father. For her heart. Thank you, Lord. Jesus said, My God, my God, my God, my God, my God, my God. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Oh, Rene Andre Moshiave, Kaya Lama Hoshalama. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Melissa, this is very strange when I see you at that tomb with the others. And where some would go in looking. 
And it's not to put down on any. This is this is personality difference. Just keep praying for Marcus. Personality differences. Personality differences. Mary, it's as if I see if they got tired, you would say, come on, ladies, we can make it. You would literally drag them. You're driven by that intimacy, Shauna. You want to, you got to go inside the tomb. This is so crazy. Mary, you get them there. Shauna, you go in the tomb. And then Melissa, I see you running around outside the tomb like a crazy person. I mean, she's running to the garden and she's running behind the tomb and she's running by the trees. And what you know, it was a garden where, where he was running all over. And here's why, because you want to hear him more than you want to see him. Now I'm talking about him that day. God says, you have a hearing ear for my voice and you hunger for my voice. God says, I honor that because I sowed it into you. You have a hearing ear and you thirst for my voice to speak into you. And you will not be disappointed. That is so crazy this morning. So Mary, you drag them. Shawna, you'd run in and she'd run around on the outside trying to hear what the Spirit is saying. And all three of you would find him because the angel's in the tomb speaking. Jesus is outside the tomb walking. And the voice of the Spirit of God is declaring. We lift them up, God, right now, these three things. On the pathway of their life, Lord, cover them, strengthen them. My God, my God, my God, my God, my God, my God, my God. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Mary, I've got to say one more thing to you. I want to be careful because I know your life. She's like a spiritual daughter to us. We've got a lot of them that are spiritual daughters and spiritual grandchildren and all this stuff. But Mary and Sister Tamara and I sit down and talk. God just spoke to me and said, Tell you, do not have to worry about any of it and the future. He said, You do not have to worry, just trust me. Because you are the apple of my eye, says the Lord. My hand is upon you. And the Lord says, I've already commissioned. He's got two angels around you all the time. They're there. And in some cases, because of my presence, says the Lord has even made you fearless. Don't worry. Trust me, says the Lord. I've got you. You're in the palm of my hand. And I've got it. And all that you need is in front of you. That's a strong, crazy word, Marcus. <laughs> Father, we praise you this morning. I thank you, God, that you love us so much. That your word is everlasting. Thank you, Father, for your precious mercy and your grace. Thank you, Father. 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 Brad, stay in the vein of his presence. Continue to pursue him. I heard the Holy Spirit say there's a breakthrough coming for you. There's a breakthrough coming. But stay at it. Just stay at it.
mind has to read my mind by the Spirit. It's, it's, that's the verse part. It's just a... Supposed to be together. 
Maybe not then, but she did eventually. She said, you know what? This is God's plan. I believed it. So what does this got to do with offering a lot? Because truth is, God's got promises for you. And he gave me promises years ago because I look back and I'm not rich, at least not monetarily. I wish it was. Me and God have had that conversation. How many of you had a conversation with God and said, Lord, we said richer or poorer. We've tried poorer. We like to get, get richer or run it for a minute just to see how it tastes. I mean, I've had that conversation with God. It hasn't happened yet. may not happen, but, but I'm still rich in a lot of ways. Amen. I have a relationship with, with, with a woman that I'm just, I just can't, I can't do any better, I don't think. It's just not, it's just there. It's all I can tell you. I've got more kids than I ever imagined I'd ever have. <laughs> Grandkids. And just, and they look at my life and it's incredible. Am I still headed in the direction God told me to go years ago? And he's led me? Yes. Have I changed the route a few times? Yes. Have I messed up yes. God's plan a few times? Yes. yes. How many of you glad for grace? Say amen. amen. Yeah. I was extended a lot of grace from my now wife, of course, early on. I probably shouldn't have gotten grace. She just looked at me and shake her head sometimes. Yeah, he's an idiot, but I think I'm going to hang around for a little bit longer. I'm glad she did. Yeah. That being said, when it comes to finances, there's a destination. God wants you to be blessed. How many of you know that you've made some stupid financial decisions along the way somewhere and you're like, yeah, I really altered the route. <laughs> I, I, I'm supposed to be there, but I'm not because this was dumb. And just like relationship choices, financial choices sometimes take a long time to get back on the right track. Y'all with me on that? Yeah? So, okay. So, my intention was to talk about something completely different uh, on offering this morning. And uh, when Tina came in, I, I saw her and I was just like... Yes, and then I got to think it. And so I guess this is what the Lord wanted me to tell you. When it comes to your finances, if you miss a week, you say, well, I didn't get the tithe, or I didn't get the gift. Don't disqualify yourself. Sometimes we, we mess up, or we make mistakes, and we feel like, well, God doesn't do it. God still wants to bless you, and he still wants to get you to the destination that he's designed for you. Because scripture says he's got plans for us. Can I get an amen from somebody? He's got plans for you. You're going to have to walk through the decisions and the consequences of your actions and your, your choices. Y'all with me on that? But that doesn't end the, it doesn't end the plan. God's not just saying, well, never mind. They messed up there. No, you've just changed the route. You've not changed the destination. Can I get an amen from somebody? God's got a destination for you in your finances, in your relationship, in your career goals, whatever it is. But just because you've made a mistake somewhere along the way. Thank God for His grace. Understand it and say, Lord, how do I get back? And sometimes the journey to get back is just a little bit quick. Sometimes it's one-way streets. You know what I'm talking about? You just got off an exit, and it's one-way streets to take you so many miles out of the direction before you can, you can get back to where you're supposed to be. It delays you. So I'm speaking to the folks in this house. You feel like you've been delayed? Well, look at it and be honest. Did you make a bad decision somewhere? Probably. Because we're human. But if not, trust God. Trust God with your destination. Trust Him with what you, He's given you. And I and challenge you just to plant seed into Him and say, Lord, this is what I've got right now. I'm still believing. Let's see what happens. I don't deserve the life that I live. I know that. I mean, financially, I'm not rich, but I am blessed. Amen. And I'm blessed in a lot of ways. So when God says He's got plans to bless you, it's not always just about finances. Can I get you, man? I know a lot of people got money. Some of them are miserable. Some of them are happy. It just depends. It's not, not, not it. But right now, whatever you got in money, trust Him with it. Trust Him with it. Maybe you need to plant a seed. Say, Lord, I need to get back on track. And ask the Lord right now. So what's it going to take right now? What, what kind of step of faith do I need to take? Maybe you got to put a little something extra here today. Listen, I don't care what you give. We're not that kind of church. I don't see. Y'all know that. I, don't, I have no clue who gives what. I just want to right now just to say, you know what? Let's be honest with God. And say, Lord, I want to be on the track. I want to go to the destination you want me to go. And ask him, so, Lord, what is it going to take right now? Do I need to plant a seed right now? Do I need to stretch just a little bit? And y'all know I don't, I don't push this part of it. But I just kind of feel like today maybe that's the, that's the idea. Maybe we're just kind of trucking along. And the Lord said, you know, if you'll just take a little step of faith, the next turn is right around the corner. 
I'm not trying to bleed you for money. This, don't, don't, don't put your light bill in there unless God tells you to. Okay, don't do that. That's not what I'm trying to say. But there might be something in you. You say, Lord, this is what I need to do. You do what he tells you to do. You give what he tells you to give today. Because I am glad I'm still headed. And I feel like I'm still headed to the destination. And I want you all to make that same destination. Right? Y'all with me on that? So let's grab our offering today right now. Let's just lift it before the King Father. We lift it right now to honor you. Some of us have empty hands right now because we don't have anything today, but we're believing. We're believing. Father, we want to meet the destination. You want to bless us. We know that. Father, I ask for your grace and your forgiveness for the poor decisions that we've made. Help us, Father, to be more wise, to be more conscious about what we're doing with our finances. Lord, teach us to trust you like never before. Bless those who can give today, those who are giving tithe. Meet the needs according to your word. Those who are blessing you, Father God, with an offering today. I pray that that seed will grow in Jesus' mighty name. If you believe what we pray, say amen. amen. The Bible says we're the cheerful givers. It's now time to give it up. puts in your heart 
I told Sister Timmy, so only 17 people need to give $100. I think that will cover it. So just pray about that. Some of you have already given. We thank you. You got us to where we're at. And he told me, he said, David, you got 30 days to, to pay the difference on this thing. I said, well, we'll have it in 30 days. I promise you. And, um, and so what I'm going to ask you to do is pray about an amount and just write for air conditioning. And, and give it, you know, whether today or next week or the week after, does not matter to me. And that's why the little brown, brown bath, uh, round offering plate is here. And oh, by the way, I want to show you this too. See the black spot on it? This plate was in the fire when our building burned down. This was our offering plate, and we didn't want to get rid of it, so we hung on to it. But you got a little black spot on there. We had two offering plates. And that banner back there says King, King survived the original fire that burned our building down. So, pretty awesome. What? Oh, and the table, yes. And the table survived. The table has a bunch of burn spots on it, but I don't want to get rid of it. I just think it's uh, something to remember. Fires are good sometimes, isn't it? I mean, come on, we have a much nicer building now. Uh, also, Men's Fellowship Breakfast is the 24th, 8 a.m. That's be next, is that next Saturday? And after that breakfast, so we're going to get in there and eat quickly and fellowship quickly. I would really like to, unless this is such a fantastic week here, I don't know. I need some help getting that building ready, okay? I need to haul some stuff out of it. We need to move some stuff. Um, I actually am probably going to order a dumpster <laughs> and just have them drop it off. We're going to load it up with some stuff. So. We've got to have a work day coming up, so we're going to need some help there. And so if, um, if you can help us, we're going to have breakfast uh, at 8 a.m. Saturday, and then uh, we may slip over here and do a little bit of work. I don't want to keep it past noon. But if you're, pardon me? At IHOP, thank you. And if you're available during the week to help us do anything, let me know. Because the more we get done, the faster we can get in there. Um, and so I believe in God for uh, a lot of things back there to happen, new carpet and all this stuff. Last thing I want to say is uh, there is a meeting scheduled. I don't know where Susan's at, but uh, Amy, you're going to have the meeting uh, if Susan is not here. But uh, this, if, if you're not familiar, we do Toys for Tots every year. Now, I'm going to say this. We started out um, with 15 kids. The biggest year we had where we gave toys out was 1,200. We had a full 1,200, over 1,200 children, I believe. And then we've averaged out over the years probably eight to 900, somewhere in there, that we supply gifts for, uh, five to seven gifts apiece. It's a wonderful thing. And we're able to reach to the community. Uh, we put on a Christmas program. Uh, we have our distribution center and all the things that go on. Uh, Right in the middle of all that love that we're spreading, how many know that your children break their toys? Come on. How many know that for some children, the box is more important than the toy? We, we know this. My point is, the toys aren't the whole purpose. Salvation is. The gospel message of Jesus Christ is. Are you hearing me? And this is going to be a very, and I have to take a minute on this, and then I'll, I'll bring my message, and I'll be quick on that. I promise we'll keep it till 3 o'clock again. Um, that was a joke. No one even laughed. Wow. Uh, thank you. Every year, we set tables up. If the if building's available, we'll just figure out where we're going to be. Every year we set, set tables up, we bring people in, we talk to them, uh, we have an application, the application's filled out. We've had people come in and do interviews that you know barely knew the Lord and doing the interviews. Well, I'm just going to say this, all the interviewers will be saved this year. All the interviewers will be saved. They're either going to get saved while they're interviewing or they're going to be saved. Because this year is unlike any other year we have ever had. 
I don't want one person coming in, and I'm, Amy, I can't say for the meeting, so I'm throwing my part, I can finish it up. I don't want one person coming in, filling an application now, and getting a, a short two second prayer, we'll see you at, at the uh, orientation, and they leave. I want you to have scriptures this year to lead them straight to Jesus Christ if they'll receive him. So we're going to shift it a little bit because this may be the only opportunity that we have to minister to the ones that come in. We're going to have to limit the program to two people, a family, and that's it. So all the people that come in, and you know we've had a, how many have had a rough year this year? This, this has been a crazy year for a lot of people. You've had an underlying stress level that's just stayed there. We've got an election and we've got corona. We've got all sorts of stuff that's gone on this year. And we have to bring them in, see two in a chair, move the space over, and two more and move the space over. So we won't house nowhere near the amount. We usually have 250 people per night. It won't happen. Maximum about 150. That's going to be it. They can only bring one person with them. So my point is, they're not going to hear or see a program, many of them. So I want to make a shift and deliberately minister. And look, if you don't even know what to say, it's all right. There'll be people there to help you. You just got to say whatever they tell you to say. And then open your heart up and the Holy Spirit will bring you to a place where you can minister. And maybe we can... Get like other people to come over and help you minister when the ministry time starts. You understand what I'm saying? So you don't have to say, hey, I'm going I'm to grab all this. I'm going to bring them straight to the Lord. You might just bring them to the place saying, can we pray for you? And you say, pause. Hey, Melissa, would you come and, and Melissa run over and lead them to Jesus while you help? And then we pray for them. Is, is everybody understand? So I want to up our level of interviewing this year yeah. that it becomes more ministry as well besides our program. Is that okay with everybody? We'll give the Lord in. So if you are going to help us with the interviews, which we need all the help we can get, don't, don't say, well, I'm not smart enough. All you need to do is, is love Jesus. Meet right after service. Amy's going to have a quick meeting just to tell you when, what, and where, and uh, some some information on the application. We want to cover that with you. And oh, by the way, thank you. Saturday morning, um, there were so many volunteers helping move the toys that I think we had three trailers and, and uh, one truck and some something else filled up with boxes, and they were finished. It was finished within an hour. Within an hour. That means go get it, load it, and unload it. Within an hour, it was done. Can we give them a big hand? And say thank you? And, uh, so if, and if you'd like to be a part of the Toys for Cons program, please uh, feel free to join us. Okay. The meeting is right after church. Would you stand to your feet, please? Can we give Jesus one more shout, if you don't mind? <laughs> This is the word of God. This is the word of God. Everything it says, I am. Says, I, am. I, am. I am. Everything it says, I can do. I can do. Everything it says, I have. I can do. Everything it says, I have. I have. When I hide it in my heart, let it be formed to my mouth. When I speak it in faith, it unleashes the creative power of God that causes me to walk in. Victory, Victory, success, success deliverance, deliverance, healing, healing and prosperity. prosperity. Come on, give me one more shout. <laughs> Excuse me, that was a hard one to open up. Open your Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 25. And then we're going to go to Acts 27. I'm going to try to tie in an Old Testament story and a New Testament story together, and I think you'll understand it. But this is the storyline of Abraham having a son, Isaac, and Isaac having twins, Jacob and Esau. Yeah. Now, Jacob and Esau were literally opposites. Jacob liked to hang around the house, take care of some of the animals and cook and things like that. 
And Esau was a hunter. Esau's father liked him a lot. And Jacob's mother liked him a lot. And Jacob was there. Esau was the firstborn. And in my Bible, I don't want to give you the list, but there's about 23 or 24 things that the firstborn in the biblical days got. They got a double portion of the inheritance. They got the family authority where they were the ruler, just like the father was, of the house and all his goods. And there were so many more things that the firstborn had. The firstborn would have been the name mentioned in the lineage of the coming Messiah. I mean, the firstborn would step directly into the financial and promised blessings of Abraham. The firstborn was a big deal when you read about it. Everybody with me? Amen. So I want to go here, and I just want to start on verse 29 because I don't have time to read all of the story. But Esau goes hunting, and he was uh, probably not a good preparer. I'm not really sure what went on. I, I won't talk about my grandsons or son-in-laws that go hunting, but I'm just going to say sometimes things happen when you're hunting. And so something happened to where this young man, Esau, is like to starve to death and die. Um, he's out there. Maybe he just didn't pack a good lunch. I don't know. Maybe a bear ate his lunch. I don't really know what happened. All I know is he goes hunting. I don't know if he caught anything. If he did, he would have probably ate it. He was starving. So I'm not really sure of the details. It doesn't give any indication that he brought back some food with him. It gives every indication that he had nothing and that he was literally starving to death. On, on the journey home, his brother Jacob decides to have an outdoor family barbecue. Yeah. And he's just stirring it up. He has some stew he's making, lentils and a variety of vegetables, and it smells really good. He puts some olive oil in it and some other things in it. And he's got this stew just, just smelling real good. And so Esau, he looks up and he sees his brother Esau coming out of the woods. And the guy is famished. He's about to go down. Yeah. Now, I don't know how far away he was from the home. They might have been right in the front yard. I'm not sure. There might have been cookies baking in the kitchen. But Jacob was outside making the stew. And I want to read this to you. And Jacob sawed pottage or made Potty, it's kind of a terrible name for food. And Esau came from the field, and he was fainting. Verse 30, chapter 25. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I beg you, with this red pot in Jamaica, for I'm fainting. And therefore his name was called Edom. And Jacob said, No. You imagine two brothers, this guy comes out of the woods, he's dying, and you made your meal, and it smells so good. And he walks up and says, brother, please give me some of that lentil stew. And he says, no, sir, unless you sell me your birthright. And Esau said, behold, I'm at the point of dying. What profit shall my birthright be to me? Big mistake. Jacob said, swear to me this day. And he said, I swear. And he sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage and lentils. And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now remember, I, I, I'm trying to find. Let me just read this if I can get it. Page 98. Just bear with me. I'm just going to read to you just a real quick. I'm going to speed read to you. The blessings of birthright, 22 of them. Family inheritance, family supremacy, the father's blessing, the spiritual leader and priest of the home and the tribe, the choice of all the family lands, fruitfulness in your offsprings, special providence, personal blessings, a great name among everybody, personal blessings to all nations, internal inheritance, Eternal inheritance, a special party to the Abrahamic covenant, 
the father of the Messiah, the father of many nations, the father of kings, the eternal natural seed. Have Jehovah as a special God. Have power over your enemies. Have headship of nations, material prosperity, spiritual blessing of Abraham, justification by faith, and curse upon all your enemies. The birthright was a big deal. And I wrote this down. He sold it for a bowl of fleshly desire. He said, what good is my birthright if I die? Let me tell you something. It had been worth dying for. But he took his birthright, the promised blessing from who? His father was Isaac. His father was Abraham. Abraham was the guy that God said to him, I will bless everyone that blesses you, curse everyone that curses you. Out of you, Abraham, will come the entire Jewish nation. Listen, Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. They don't even mention Esau because he sold his birthright. Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to the nation of Israel. The, today's nation of Israel, the name Israel really came from Jacob. Are you hearing me? So that was a promise that was for Esau. And Esau said, I'd rather fill my belly than examine the value of my birthright. Are you with me? Open your Bible to the book of Acts chapter 27. Now these might not seem to go together, but I think they will. Remember when Jesus, and this isn't the story, but when Jesus fed the 5,000 and they followed him, and he went across the sea, and they showed up. He got mad at them, basically. Not mad, but just frustrated. He said, you know what? Here's the problem. You're not seeking me for the miracle blessings. You're seeking me for your belly only. You got fed supernaturally with fish and bread. So now you're not coming because I performed the miracle. You're coming so you can get more food. And he's saying it's backwards. And they all left. They got upset at him when he was done talking because he was making it clear. You must value that which is unseen and eternal. It's the blessing on God's children. And oh, by the way, the Abraham blessing went to Isaac, went to Jacob, who became Israel, and then was on Jesus because he's a part of that, and then from Jesus to you and I, which were the Gentile world, so you get to walk in the blessings of Abraham even today. Can somebody give the Lord a shout of praise? Understanding our inheritance. Somebody said one time, you know, it's, it's many people know who the Lord is, but they don't know who they are in the Lord. That's right. I know He's my Savior. I know He's my healer. I know He performs miracles. I know I'm going to stand before Him and be accounted for my life. I know he made heaven and hell and all the earth, but often people don't know who they are in him, just who he is. And that's a lack of grasping the value of our inheritance. We must recognize that we have been grafted into the kingdom of God and we're walking in an eternal inheritance. And listen to me, it's more than just getting to heaven. It's while walking on the earth. Pastor Marcus just spoke about it. Sister Ruth wrote about it. It's the promise of God that says you can walk in heavenly places while on earth. I don't want a God that's at a distance. I don't want a God that's sitting on my dashboard. I want a God that says, I will be in you and upon you. I'll be your very best friend. I know you from the inside out. I created you in my image and my likeness. I have plans for you. You've been fearfully and wonderfully made. You are my sons and my daughters. And because you made the choice to accept my call, you get the inheritance that comes with the family prosperity. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Our lives are different than the world's. Your life as a Christian is filled with promises, is filled with blessings. Jeremiah 29, 11, that young people were quoting for two, three years straight. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans of blessings and promise, a thought that's already laid out for you. That's the God I serve. How awesome it is that I don't have to worry about a single thing. 
older gentleman, he, he passed away. But he would say, Lord, if we do this, if we do that, then everything's going to be all right. He'd always end his prayer. Brother Harrison, everything's going to be all right. Every single time, day after day, prayer after prayer. And God, everything's going to be all right. It becomes all right when we can rest in who he is and we can walk through this life saying, I grab a hold of my inheritance. I am somebody. I am a son, not just a child. I am a son of the most high God. And I have some rights that others don't have. And I have some privileges that others don't have. I am a son Amen. or a daughter of the most high God. Yeah. That's who he is. I walk in that benefit blessing. Now, over in the book of Acts, chapter 27, we're going to try to tie this together. There was a major shift about to happen. The Apostle Paul was a religious man. The Apostle Paul knew that he was a child of God. But on the road to Damascus, Acts chapter 9, you find that he had an encounter with Jesus. And it's at that point, he was no longer just a child of God. He became a son of God. He understood, I'm walking. I understand, he was trained under the best of the best. Gamaliel was the trainer, the teacher. He was the Pharisee among Pharisees. I mean, this guy was the up-and-coming big dog. He was the one, reputation, everything. He was the one that got orders out of all the religious system. He got orders that he could go kill the church, you, Christians. And on the road to Damascus, a light comes from heaven, and he hears a voice from God. And, and he says, who are you? He says, I am Jesus who you're persecuting. And oh, by the way, Paul or Saul, I got a calling on your life, and you can fight all you want, but you're not going to win because I've got you. He said, Saul, I don't want you to just be a child of God. That's what you are. You don't have any clue of the intimacy. But I'm going to change your life in three days. You will recognize that now you're a son of God. You are walking in the inherited promises of salvation and the blessing of my anointing that is on you. You will step into the blessing of Abraham that is cast down through Jesus Christ. You are somebody. You're a walking carrier, a walking tabernacle. You're one that carries the power that raised Christ from the dead. You will be a son of God. And that's what the invitation of salvation is. Hey, you get to not just be a child of God born in the world, but now you get to be a son of God with a future and an inherited blessing. So, Paul understands, I am somebody. So I want to go to verse 21, chapter 27. He's on his way to Rome because he made an appeal to Caesar. He's arrested because of preaching the gospel. They get in a boat, or a ship, should I say. And on their journey, a great storm comes, and the ship is about to be destroyed. So I'm going to start with verse 21. It says, But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them. Understand, he's on a ship. It's going up and down. It's breaking to pieces. They've thrown food overboard. They're trying everything they can to stay alive. This is down to the end of we're all going to sink and die. The storm won't stop. The, the wind is raging. The sea is pounding. We're throwing stuff overboard. And we're just hoping that we might survive this thing. Can you understand this? Christians don't have to hope they survive. Because the quicksand or the sea or the tornadoes, excuse me, or the cancer or the COVID or anything is not in charge of your or my life. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. I won't go to he says go. I won't leave to he says it's time because that's who he is. Amen. That's why Pastor Marcus speaks about the financial blessings. It's a part of the process. After long absence. 
Ephesus, Paul stood up in the midst of them. He was a prisoner. But even being a prisoner, God gave him great respect and authority. Did you hear me? Yeah. Even being a prisoner, he had great respect and authority. So he said, sirs, you should have listened to me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. I warned you, God told me it's not going to be a good trip. He was in prayer. They said, it looks pretty good to us. He said, you're making a mistake. Listen. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. For there shall not be loss of any man's life among you, but will lose the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of the Lord, who, whose I am and who I serve. Said, fear not, Paul. Listen, listen, listen. Fear not, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. Paul, you're a son of God. And I have a commission for you. You have to make it to the destination. Are you hearing me? And lo, God has given you all them that sail with you. Did you hear what I said? The whole ship would have crashed and they would have died. Every single man on that ship except Paul was on the boat with them. Amen. Anybody hearing me? One time I think it was Jesse Duplantis was on an airplane and something was going wrong and people saying, we're going to die. And he basically said, it's impossible because God's not done with me yet. So relax because I'm on the airplane. You're going to make it just fine. Now that may sound like arrogance. It may sound like pride. But it sounds like somebody knows who they are in Christ. Somebody knows who I belong to. When you belong to Jesus Christ and you're walking in his commission, he rules, the world doesn't rule, nothing else rules. Are you hearing me? So he said, fear not, I must go to Caesar and I'll give you those that sail with you. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe that it shall be even as it was told me, howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. The Spirit of God said to Paul, look, you're going to have church service on an island called Malta. But when the 14th night was come, and we were driven up and down in the Adrian, about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near some country. And they sounded and found that it was 20 following this is getting deep. And verse 29, then fearing lest we should fall upon the rocks, they cast the anchors out of the stern and wished for day. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, they were pretending like they were uh, lowering down the safety boats, but realistically they were getting ready to get out. Paul said to the centurion, look, if those sailors leave, we're going to die. The centurion said, you're not going to know where they cut the ships off. He said, you're stuck with us. What this man says, we're going to do. You know why? Because I don't care if you're a prisoner, if you're free, if you're poor, if you're rich. When you walk in Jesus and he starts speaking, you walk in his authority. Remember when he cleaned the temple out? Nobody dared walk. It was almost a city block wide, and not a soul would cross the pathway because authority was speaking. Remember when the Father said, let there be light, and there was? That's the level of authority that you walk in when you truly hear the voice of God. Are you understanding? Silver and gold have I none. But what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he pulled him up and he went walking, leaping, and praising God because the authority is in the word of the living God. Yes. Yes. Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, except these stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes and the boat let it fall. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them. And he said, okay, guys. You haven't eaten anything for 14 days. You need to eat. Wherefore I pray you that some eat some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall not a hair from your head perish. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks. And in the presence of them all, he's in charge of the boat, guys. The prisoner's in charge of the boat because God can't be in prison. <laughs> wow. Then were they all of good cheer and took comfort. And we were in the ship two hundred and three score and sixty souls. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and they threw the food into the sea. 
And when it was day, they knew that the land, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain area of water with the shore in which they were minded to go. If it were possible, they were going to thrust the ship onto the dry land and survive this disaster. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed, everyone say committed. They committed themselves to the sea, and they loosed the rudder bands. In other words, they allowed the rudder to be free to guide them. They hoisted up the mainsail with the wind. Everyone say, the mainsail with the wind. The mainsail with the wind. And they made toward the shore. Listen, it takes a lot of guts to be in a storm, to pull the anchors up, to, to get the rudders prepared, and put the mainsail up and say, we're just going to end up wherever we end up. What gave them such confidence is that the man on board knew I am a son of the Most High God, and he told me everything's going to be all right. Amen. It may be a little difficult. It may be a journey you don't like, but when I'm done, you will survive it. I promise you, I'll get you to the other side. So they put the sail up. The wind is moving hard, the rain. These guys were in a mess. They said, okay. We're trusting you. Wherever we go, Paul, it's in your hands. Now listen. So they're going, and they're thinking, I know the answer. We're going to make it to the seashore, and we'll just all get off this boat, and it's going to be all right. And Paul said, nah, not quite. You see, when God wants to get rid of some junk, he does it all the way. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground. And the fore part stuck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. I mean, come on. These waves were big enough to bust the back end of a ship. The front stuck in the sand. The back is getting hammered. The soldiers counsel, let's kill the prisoners lest any of them should escape. That's the law. And the centurion, willing to save Saul, kept them from that purpose and commanded that they could all swim. Jump off the boat, boys, and pray for the best. And the rest, some came on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safely to the land. Amen. Let me tell you something. God has a real habit of breaking up the things that we have made our safety and our security. He's got a habit of busting up some stuff. And we end up in the sea of where in the world am I going? The wind's blowing, the storms are raging, and God is saying, didn't I tell you, just trust me? I mean, just trust me. You're going to get to where you need to be, and I'm not just doing stuff to torment you. I've got a purpose. You see, God didn't want them to sail by Malta. He wanted them to stop at Malta because he had a work. There was a guy named Publius, and his father was dying, and tradition says Publius became the bishop or the pastor of that island after Paul was done ministering because God has ways that are above our ways and plans that are above our plans. It's hard to go in faith because we can't see the future, but God says, I've already lined the future out. Just trust me. Yes. On the journey. So when they were escaped, they came to the land. It was called Melita, or Malta. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness. Don't you love King James Version? It means that they showed us a lot of kindness. They kindled a fire, and they received every one of us because of the present rain and because of the cold. And Paul, he obviously wasn't in chains because the soldiers realized we are working with someone greater than Caesar or greater than the chain. This guy just told us every detail what's going to happen, and it did. His God must be for real. Listen. When Saul gathered a bundle of sticks and he laid them on the fire, there came out a poisonous viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarous people saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt, this man must be a murderer who, though he is the sea, yet vengeance suffers him not to live. They prejudged him because of what he's going through. 
Anyone ever have that happen? <laughs> I'm going through hell, but I'm going to make it on the other side. And those people over there are just judging you like crazy because they know. They don't know. God knows. They're standing there watching, saying, look, this guy just got bit by a snake. It's going to kill him. Watch him. He's going to die. He must be a murderer. God's vengeance is on him. And they're accusing and they're attacking him verbally under their breath. They're, a gossip column just started. And they're watching. And he shook the snake into the fire. And he didn't go, Shakarada wa hashiki andai. Oh, intercessors, come and pray. There was none. He couldn't call on anybody. There was no gathering of Christians in the back corner. He didn't have a cell phone. All he had was God. No. All he had was, I know who I am in God. I am a son of the Most High. If I die, I'll die. If I live, I live. But I'm shaking it off either way. Anybody getting that? Yeah. If I live, I live. If I die, I die. But I'm shaking it off anyway. Because I'm a son of the Most High God. He did not know the end result. But he just stood in faith. I don't think so. He stood in who he was as a son of God. He shook it off. And he went and sat down. He might have been under his breath. Shook the road. I'm not ready to come yet, but if you want me to, it's all right. Because you remember, this is the same guy that said, you know, I really want to get out of here. But I'm going to stay for your sakes. He said, I've got work to do. Now listen, how be it, they looked. And when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they looked a great while, they saw no harm come to him, and they changed their minds, and they said, he must be a god. How quickly the minds of deep work changed. I hate him. I love him. I'm going to have fun. He's the greatest president in the world. He's the worst. <laughs> I mean, we just flip around like a piece of bacon on a frying pan sometimes. It's amazing. He's a murderer. No, he's a god. No, he's a son of the living God. I want you to know something. When God's adjusting our lives, our ship may go crazy. It may sink. It may break up. People might be floating on pieces of wood, but it does not matter if you know you, who you are inherited. Who, if you know your inheritance. If you know who you belong to. Amen. You see, Esau said, I don't really care about who I belong to. I just want the food. I want to fill my own desires with my own feeling. Kind of like that young man that said, Dad, give me my inheritance. I want to go out. And the dad saying, Son, it's not about the money. It's about your character. You don't know who you are yet, so go head on. The boy goes out there. He spends all the money on rides living. He's feeding the pigs. He's eating the pigs. He thinks, I'm going to go home and be a servant. Dad says, no, you're going to come home and be a son. I'm just trying to get your head screwed on straight. Do you understand? This is who you are. You're a son of the Most High God. Do you understand, church? We're not beggars saying, oh, God, why aren't you doing it? Somewhere in there we've got to say, God, tell me what you want me to do. I trust you, period. Because I'm a son of God. So they decided he's a man. In the same quarters were uh, possessions of the chief man. Of the, uh, in other words, the, guy, the chief guy had houses. They put him in there. And they lodged him. It was good. And it came to pass that his father, the father of Publius, remember, who became the bishop, he lay sick of the fever and a bloody flux. And uh, Paul entered in and prayed and laid hands on him and healed him. And after that happened, they started bringing all kinds of diseased and sick people. Whoever's going to play the keyboard, come on. They started bringing in all kinds of sick and diseased people, and they brought them in. And Paul, in the name of Jesus Christ, is healing them. How can he use the name of Jesus Christ? Because he is the son of the Most High God. Do you understand? He was given authority. God said, I want to send you to an island to cause a revival, to cause a move of my spirit. You're your life is going to touch somebody else's life. You may have to ride a rough road. You may have to go through some stormy times. You may even have to see where your security is breaks to pieces. You may fall in the water. It may be cold. There may be a snake bite. You may be afraid. But trust me, I am God. And you are my daughter. You are my son. You are somebody. You're a miracle. You are that which you can inherit it. My blessings in your life. 
He said the same spirit that raised me from the dead is in you. Oh, don't be offended. Listen to me. Adam was no more a son of God than you. Listen. Jesus Christ was no more a son of God than you. You are sons and daughters of the Most High God. Amen. You see, we're flipping out because the boat's going up and down. I don't know, but did somewhere on the journey we sell our inheritance? for fleshly gratitude. Somewhere on the journey, we, we said, my birthright, I lay it down for what my flesh can have. And what God is saying, if you'll lay down what your flesh desires, you can walk in the birthright of who you are. And you'll have my hand. Don't go to college, but listen, 
I walked out of high school, walked down the street, and I here was my declaration. Your will be done. Guide me to where I'm supposed to go because I'm clueless. Being clueless doesn't make you fatherless. Amen. Lord, yeah. He led me to a, a business. For the next 11 years, they trained me how to lead people. And after that, God says, okay, I'm calling you to the ministry. He lied my future.
right there. He's walking up on the stage. And then the